Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you today. What a great day in the Lord it is. Glad to see you here. We're in our study in Nehemiah. In fact, it's our fourth message in the book of Nehemiah as we've been talking about leadership and what it takes to be a great leader for the Lord. Remember, as we've been going through this particular session, we've dealt with uh, what is a leader, first of all, in our first lesson about the importance of all of us if we are believers and God has called us to a role, whether we believe it or not, like it or not, to be leaders. Remember we said leaders are people that influence other people. God has left us here on the planet, didn't take us right to heaven when we got saved for a reason. And that's to make a difference in the world that we're living in. We're called ambassadors for Christ. That, that involves leadership. We're called the salt of the earth. That involves leadership. That's influencing people. We're called the light of the world. Light influences a, a, a situation. So we're all called to be influencers in the culture that we live in. We're here to make a difference. So we've talked about in Nehemiah, we see in Nehemiah really the, the perfect illustration of what a good leader is and what it takes for leadership. In the first message, we talked about character and integrity. Now I know uh, <laughs> in the, in, with all the politicians going uh, and making their debut and airing on the way, airwaves today that you don't see character... Uh, is in high, high standing these days. Uh, but I want you to know in scripture, to be a leader, God requires high standards. He, there's, a, there's a level you should rise to of integrity. There's a level of honesty and a level of character that's required of all of us if we're gonna be leaders in the kingdom of God. We talked about how, in, in that first message, about how Nehemiah was a man of character, a man of integrity. The second message we talked about was how, if you want to be a leader, how important prayer is and how leaders, how they pray. And we saw in Nehemiah a four-month period that he prayed from the time that he got the news that the walls of Jerusalem, you know, were, were, were in dismay and the people were in despair and depression. And he, and he got that report from his brother who'd been to Jerusalem about how bad things were. He got a burden. He began to pray about it. Ultimately, in responding to that burden, God calls him to go and lead the way. But it starts with integrity, and then it goes from there to being a person of prayer. And then last week, we talked about how leaders plan, and talked about how Nehemiah came up with a plan. And it became very clear that when the king said, what's the matter with you, Nehemiah? I've never seen you like this before. Man, he just went right into it. He said, first I prayed, because I, I was afraid. Because what he was getting ready to tell the king was not popular. In fact, he's going to ask the king for permission to rebuild the walls to a city that the king said, the walls won't be rebuilt. All right. There was a law in place. In fact, the walls had been tried to be built some 70-something years earlier, even under Ezra, who went back to rebuild the temple prior to Nehemiah. He goes back, he's allowed to rebuild the temple, but not the walls. There were people of influence for the Persian kingdom who were tax collectors and governors and officials over the area under the king that did not want the walls to be rebuilt. And so even when Ezra tried, they sent word back to the Artaxerxes that, you know, don't let those guys rebuild the wall. If you do that, we're not going to be able to tax them and all the other benefits that we're going to get from them, we're not going to get. But Nehemiah goes with a word now from the king because God moved in the king's heart with, to, and, and blessed the plan that Nehemiah had for rebuilding the walls. So we talked about the importance of having a plan, a plan for your family, a plan for your own life. Where are you spiritually? Where do you want to be spiritually? If you don't have a plan, you're not going to get there. Remember what we said about people who fail to plan, plan to fail. And so what's the plan in your own life right now? Where are you going with God? What are your expectations? Where are, you, where are you in your walk with God? Where do you want to be? Where do you believe God wants you to be? You know, what's the next step in your life? What's the plan for your family? So we see that these, these rules are what we can call them the laws of leadership are applicable all across the board, especially for believers how important it is that we come up with, with, a, with, a, with a methodology, so to say, of making some important plans in our life. And so we dealt with that last week. This week, we're moving to, to, a, to, a, to a topic that I almost just didn't go to because uh, when you look at it, it's, it's very practical lessons on leadership, but it, it, it really focuses on, on it, where I had it before, of just focusing on people in, in leadership roles and in, in, in ministry and in pastoral leadership and, and things like that. In fact, it's a message that I'd shared with the staff at one of our staff retreats. It's a message that I've shared with pastors in Bulgaria and pastors in Belize about the importance of how, how do leaders motivate other people? You know, how do you, how do you get people in on, on the plan that you believe that God's given you and the word that God's given you? And Nehemiah breaks it down. But the more I thought about it, the more I prayed about it, I realized just how practical it is for your life, for your own individual life, for your family. 
It's one thing for, you know, for someone to say, you know, I, I have a plan, maybe as a husband for our family, I believe where God wants us to go. You know, you got to get people on board with that. You know, remember we said to have to know if you're a leader or not, look over your shoulder. Is anybody following? Nobody's following. You're not much of a leader. So how do you motivate people to, if you want to use the popular terminology, to buy in on what you're doing, buy in on where you're going and say, I want to be a part of that. I want to, I want to embrace that. So I think that there are some really good lessons in this, this next portion of scripture from Nehemiah. And by the way, God doesn't put anything there accidentally or without purpose. Amen. So I think it's important we can all share and learn some things from this about leadership skills and what it means to successfully influence other people for the, for the will of God and for the kingdom of God as God reveals it to your own heart and your own life. So let's look in chapter 2. Last week we left off with him arriving in Jerusalem with everything he needed from the king. But when he gets there, in verse 10, when the Sambalite the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about it, him being there, it was very displeasing to them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and I was there for three days and I rose in the night, I and a, and a few men with me, and I didn't tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. Words, I had a plan, God's been put there, but I didn't tell anybody. There was no animal with me except the animal which I was riding. So I went out by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and to the dung gate or the refuge gate, inspecting the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down and its gates which were consumed by fire. And I passed on the fountain gate and the king's pool. There's no place for my mount to pass. In other words, this thing's a mess, all right? Verse 15, so I went up by night by the ravine and I inspected the wall and I entered the valley gate again and I returned. Now the officials did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I yet told the Jews the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. I imagine there's something going on here. They know something's going on here. Here's this guy who showed up with all these materials. He's got a small cavalry with him. I mean, he's got, got an abundance of supplies. What's this guy doing in town? He's not talking to anybody. All right, here he is. It's verse, verse, six, it's verse uh, 17. I said to them, you see the bad situation? Now he's speaking to them. We're, we're in that Jerusalem is desolate. And its gates are burned by fire. Come, let's rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a disgrace or reproach. And I told him how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. And then they said to me, let's rise and build. So they put their hands to do the good work. But when Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Geshem, the Arab, heard it, they mocked us, ridiculed us, despised us, said, what's this thing you're doing? You're rebelling against the king. So I answered and said to them, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will rise and build. But you have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. So he shows up. We see the process of which he goes through. But out of what happens in these verses here, these 10 or so verses, man, you get it. You, you can see a real clear, deliberate plan being put into place whereby he's, he's, he's moving and he's operating in such a way, things are happening in people's hearts and minds and you see them ultimately get on board with what he's doing. Remember when he goes, there've been those who've tried to do this beforehand who have failed and failed miserably, all right? You know, but he realizes, you know, that if he's gonna get there, he's not gonna be able to do it by himself. It's gonna require him influencing some people to get on board with him to make a decision, all right? You're not gonna rebuild this wall without other people helping him do it. Twice before, in the 90 years preceding this moment, they had tried to rebuild the walls. Twice they fell. Both times, those times and attempts were met with great, great criticism and great resistance. So for 90 years, people have been sitting around saying, it can't be done. It's not going to work. We tried that before. What's the use? Others have done it, but he comes, he gets on the scene prayed up, prepared, ready to go, analyzes the situation, and you see him put together the people of God, mobilize the people of God, and in 52 days, they accomplish what nobody else had been able to do in 90 years. Now, the question is, is he some kind of miracle worker, or is he just a man of God who knows how to lead people? I believe the latter is true. I, under, I believe he understood the principles of biblical motivation how to motivate people towards the will of God. 
Now, I want this to be very practical. And when, I, like I, when I've taught it to pastors and with pastors and shared it in conferences, the, you know, these principles we go over very practically and how they can be applied to our spiritual life. But this can be, no matter where you are, I mean, you may be in a situation, you're on a new job, you've been promoted, you know, or, and you have to have the cooperation of other people. You're going to get something from this today, all right? I mean, anytime you introduce change into a situation or an organization or a church, you're going to need to know how to get people on board. Anytime as a husband, a head of a family, you decide to introduce some change into the family, you're going to meet with some resistance and you're going to know how you're going to need to know how to get your family on board with what you believe God's calling you to do. I mean, it could be as simple as something in your school. God's been putting on your heart to do at school and a work he wants you to do there, a Bible study or something along those lines that he wants you to begin. You're going to meet opposition, but there is a way which we can get and learn from biblically how to get people on board how we can influence people and, and, and get them moving in the direction that God wants us all moving in. So whatever the situation is where you are right now, I believe these steps of action will help you. Basically, how do leaders motivate people? Well, let's watch what he does when he arrives in Jerusalem. The first thing he does, you know, he's expecting opposition. In fact, it, prior to this, we know there's, there's Sambalat and, and Tobiah that are there already, have been resistant to this whole process, you know, uh, so he knows when he gets there, there's going to be this opposition, you know, so they don't want him promoting the welfare of the sons of Israel. They're greedy. They're living off the demise and despair and the depression. They're taxing the people. They're, they're using the people. They're, they're, they're influencing the people for an unrighteous situation. And so Nehemiah's getting ready to go there and say, hey, let's change things. Anytime anybody says, let's change things. You can be sure there's going to be some negativity. Let's build. And Satan says just the opposite. Satan says, oh, let's not build. Let's arise. Let's oppose. Let's frustrate. There are people who are satisfied with status quo. Now, I think maybe status quo is Latin for the mess we're in. <laughs> there are people who are satisfied with the mess they're in. They're satisfied with their situation. And they resist change and they may resist for a variety of reasons, right? But leaders will expect that and begin to figure out exactly what's going on and what the reasons are. And you'll see Nehemiah through this whole book, how he deals with the opposition and how he takes care of the opposition. All right. So he's, he's not even arrived in Jerusalem, but as soon as he gets there, they're already there. They're in place. And he knew you say, well, how do you think he knew that they were going to, to oppose him? Did he send out scouts in advance, I mean, to find out what's going to happen? No, no, I just think, you know, he understood the situation. He'd been praying this. Remember, we prayed about it for four months. He knows there's going to be some opposition to whatever it is he's going to lay out before the people. Remember what Paul said at Ephesus? He said, you know, I'll stay at Ephesus for there's a real opportunity here for a great while and for a worthwhile work, even though there are many opponents. You can put those two hand in. A great worthwhile work many opponents. Something for the glory of God, many opponents. We've talked about leadership laws and principles. You can write this one down for sure. You know, there's no opportunity without opposition. Whenever you have a call for change in people's hearts and life, there's going to be opposition. So just mark it down. Don't get frustrated. Don't get defeated. Don't be, don't, don't step back and say, well, you know, I just had problems. So no, expect the opposition. If you don't, you're going to be surprised because there's going to be Opposition. It's just the way it works. We ain't never done it before is the idea. Or we ain't never done it that way is the way it comes back. Now he goes out and he expects the situation. And then he says for three days, he didn't do any. He said, I went to Jerusalem. And after staying there three days, I set out. Three days. Can you imagine what's happening in the minds of, Nehemiah, uh, of, of, of Tobiah the, and, 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 this, this, and, and who's the other guy? Thank you very much. Sandblast. Sandblaster. <laughs> Can you imagine what's happening in their minds? What's he doing here? He came with a small cavalry. Remember when he left with the king's permission, the king also said, oh, by the way, let me give you some protection. And then he left, I don't know how many truckloads, wagon loads of materials that he brought in, but there's quite a bit of supply that he's brought back with him. And so as he arrives, he's there, he's in Jerusalem. He said, after staying there three days, you know, I set out. And I like this because he doesn't make some grand entrance, you know, like, oh, the Messiah's here. You know, I'm not, no flashing flags and bands playing, no riving on the right horse. He didn't say, I'm here, you know, to save the day. Now y'all get to work. That's not the way he approaches this. 
You say, well, what's he doing for, for the three days that he's there? I mean, he's, he's in the Jerusalem. What's he doing? Well, I think there's several things you can say. Remember, this is an 800 to 1,000 mile ride on horseback. All right, you know, that's days and probably eight to 10 hour, if not longer days of riding and traveling. That's, that's fatiguing. And you should know that you never move out on major decisions and make major decisions and call for change with other people trying to influence him when you're wore out already. Second thing, I believe he's been praying. This is the pattern of Nehemiah. He's always praying. Even when he, we see those four months of prayer in the first chapter, remember when the king says, what's the matter? What did he say? And I prayed. <laughs> now the others were lengthy prayers. I'm sure that prayer was just, oh Lord, help me. <laughs> right? yeah, maybe you've been there before. And it's amazing how God answers those, oh Lord, help me, when you've been praying previously, the longer prayers and spending time with God. So I believe he's been praying. We know he's a man of prayer. I also believe that he's been planning I mean, he's reviewing his strategy. He's been working on this for months. He's got it in his mind. It's a long journey. He's been planning it all the way. But I believe also there's this element of building some curiosity. You know? there's the, you, know, you can be sure that the existing power structures in Jerusalem you know, are wondering, what's this guy here for? You know? And I believe there's some curiosity being built. What's he doing here but amongst the people? You know, there, there's this moment where the delay becomes an advantage. All right? And the advantage is, one, you're waiting for God's timing. That's what it's always about when you delay. Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time to be silent and there is a time to speak. He's waiting for the time to speak when God gives the green flag, when God says go. Because this is an important lesson to learn. If you're a person that wants to influence just as a man in your family or a wife over your children, whatever it might be, you, you speak at the right time and you're heard. You speak at the wrong time. Anybody who's been married for any length of time knows this lesson. <laughs> Amen. If you want a successful relationship, you learn when to open your mouth. You learn when to shut your mouth. You learn when to say what needs to be said. Ecclesiastes says there's a right time and a right way to do everything. If you follow the life of Jesus, one thing about Jesus is the ultimate role model for leadership. He had a tremendous sense of timing, didn't he? He'd say stuff like, oh, it's not my time or the time has not yet come or the father has not yet said to me. So he's always waiting on when God says to speak. That is a, an important and it's immeasurable how important it is, important lesson to learn when to speak, when to shut up in the right time when it's what you call that ripe moment for picking the fruit. That's an important part of learning how to motivate people when they're ready and able to hear. Now, what he does before he speaks, he's out number three, at ver the point, point number three is, is he's getting the facts first in verses 12 through 16. What's he say? I set out during the night with a few men. I didn't tell anyone what my God had put in my heart about Jerusalem. In other words, I have something God's put in my heart. He said, so we went out and we didn't take any amounts except the one that I was writing. And we went out by night and he said, we went to this wall and to that gate, to that gate, and to that wall. And we examined everything that had been broken down and had been destroyed by fire. What's he doing? He's taking an account. He's, he's viewing the situation. I mean, we talked about that even last week with planning when Jesus said, no man builds a tower unless he first sits down and counts the cost, lest he not finish it. But this is important what it says here when it says he went out to view, one verse says to, ex, one translation, he examined the walls. That's an interesting word in the Hebrew language. It's not for like to look at something or even to kind of look carefully at something. It's a medical term in the Hebrew language. And it was used when doctors or physicians would examine a wound, when there would be a severe wound, and the idea he's probing and he's inspecting that wound because it is a wound. There's, there's a tremendous problem in Jerusalem. There's no protection, there's no security. And he's, he's examining, it says, actually inspecting every part of the damage to the walls. And he only takes a little group with him. The people he brought most likely, he's not out to attract any attention. Now, anybody in leadership who's been in kind of leadership role for any length of time at all knows this is simply doing your homework. <laughs> doing the background checks, checking out the background. In fact, for a leader, this is probably the loneliest part of leadership. Where you're really taking the time to examine what the real needs are. And again, this stretches everywhere from your home to your job to your church. What are the real needs there? What's the real cause of the problem? What's going on? It's the unglamorous part. It's the part most people don't ever hear about. In verse 14, he says, there was so much rubble, they had to get off his horse just to get through it. All right. He's looking at every aspect of what's going on. I'm sure if Nehemiah is like us, and I think he probably put his pants on, 
maybe his gown on the same way we do, whatever. But I'm sure he's riding around thinking, this is worse than I thought. When they said the gates were burned, I mean, they'd burn. When they said the walls were in rubble, this is garbage. Man, I'm sorry I asked for this job. <laughs> You've had second thoughts, haven't you? I'm sure Nehemiah might have had some of his own. I did a whole lot worse than I thought, but what's he doing? Now, verse 16 says, the officials didn't know where I'd gone. Can't you imagine their ears perking up? All right. They didn't know what I was doing because I hadn't said anything to, hadn't said anything to them. He said, I hadn't said anything to the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or anybody else who would be doing the work. <laughs> and told the people I was going to involve yet. Why is he being so secretive? Because there's a time to speak and a time not to speak. The you know, worst thing I've done in ministry leadership at different times, I, as you look back over the years, they say, why did that plan stall? Because I spoke too early. I wasn't ready or I wasn't prepared or I wasn't prayed up over it. Knew what the Lord was starting to put in my heart and then spoke too quickly. Nehemiah's out there saying, I'm getting the facts, all right? I'm getting the facts. Because when you start speaking this, you want people on board. There's been 90 years of negativity, 90 years of we can't do this. You know, it's, it's, it's easier to promote a good idea or to kill a good idea. It's easier to kill the idea. And most people are experts at killing a good idea. Amen. Have you ever noticed that negative people tend to be more vocal than positive people? Yeah, they just, I mean, they're just negative about things. So Nehemiah's out there getting the facts. Simple leadership law is this. You protect your plants from premature death. And again, this applies to so many different areas of your life and ministry. Proverbs puts it this way. I believe this was a contemporary English verse. It says, get the facts at any price and hold on tightly to all the good sense you can get. Now, the King James put this this way. Buy truth. That's B-U-I. Buy truth and do not sell it. Get the facts. Get the truth. Don't let go of it. Embrace reality. Whatever the truth of God is, whatever the plan of God is, whatever the will of God is, you get it and don't let go for anything whatsoever. Proverbs 18 says, what a shame. Yes, how stupid to decide something before knowing the facts. Proverbs 14 from the Living Bible, and you know I'm not a big fan, but this is really good. It says, only a simpleton believes what he's told. A prudent man checks to see where he's going. Only a simpleton believes. See, what, what's going to happen? What, what's one of the principles of what's he doing here? Well, the idea is he's, he's gathering and researching what's going on. Long before, I know you may not see this and you don't always hear it. And you don't always, you're not, you don't sit and see what's behind the scenes. But long before any decision is made for the body of Christ at Believer's Fellowship, there's a process that's gone through. There's prayer that's gone through. Then after the prayer and the planning and the preparation and the word from God, then there's, then, there's, then there's meetings that are held between leadership leaders and, and deacons and elders and other people might be involved in that particular whatever it is, whether it's buildings or new buildings or a new campus or lift ministries or whatever we're doing. You want to have everything together. You want to be ready to move forward and have it all laid out. Here's what we believe God's telling us to do and here's how God's telling us to do it. In fact, it's down in verse 17 when he finally says, then I said to them. Got all this together? That with the oppositions? What are we going to do? Then you identify with the people. Now I love the way he puts this. Basically saying I'm one of you in verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble you are in? No. You see the trouble we are in? Come let you, no, let us rebuild and we will no longer be in disgrace. In other words, he didn't go in there and approach it as an outsider. In fact, he's, he, he is an outsider. He's, he's a Jew, but he hadn't lived in Jerusalem. He's been in captivity all this time. And now he's back there and he walks in the scene and he says, hey, he doesn't say, you guys have let this thing go to waste. You are so sorry. I can't believe you're such a disgrace. You know, I think one thing that kills motivation instantly is when you begin to blame everybody. He takes the blame himself. I'm one of you. This is our problem. This is our city. We have a responsibility. We need to do something about what's going on. Listen, he doesn't play the role of an outside expert. I know how to get this done, so follow me. You know, he just said, this is our problem. We're going to, we're going to deal with this, this together. We're going, to, we're going to take part in, the, in, in handling the, the problem together. The best ideas are not mine or yours, they're ours. And so what he does, he does what we should do. He identifies with people. And I think this is an important, this is even good in parenting, all right? You know, you get a little bit better response from your kids when they feel like you really understand them. 
I know what you're going through. I know where you're at. Instead of just the corrective measure, you're saying, hey, I'm for you. We're, we're one. We're, this is our family. This is us together. You're in, you say, this, your problem is my problem. We're going to get through this. We're going to deal with it. Whatever you're facing, whatever's going on. Now, this is the best part because you, you, this is the part, the next part here where politicians, you know, especially if they're in, in office, you know, they, they don't like to come to this next part where Nehemiah goes. He dramatizes the seriousness of the problem. All right. He said, we got a problem. He doesn't minimize it because, you know, if we dramatize it, then we're pointing out, hey, maybe I hadn't been a good leader. No, he's just saying, hey, we got a problem. I got some stuff to tell you guys. But first, the bad news. <laughs> That's where he comes from. He doesn't minimize it. In fact, it's like he's dramatized. He's emphasizing it. You say, how does he emphasize? Look at what he says. You see the trouble we're in. Jerusalem's in ruins, burned with fire. I mean, those are emotional terms. Those are stirring words of description. They're saying, now, we have a little problem on the south side of town. You know, we have a little maintenance work. We can take it. No, he said, we're in a mess. All right. This place is in ruins. It's been burned with fire. It's a disgrace. Why? Because these guys have been living there with this for years. It's been going on for years. You know, it's a fact, I believe, at least around my house, when you live with something that's needs to be fixed or a bad situation long enough, you start ignoring it. How many of you got something in your house needs to be fixed? Yeah, yeah, everybody. You know it needs to be fixed. And for the first week or two, you really noticed it. It needs to be fixed. And then it didn't get fixed, so after that, it's no big deal. This, hey, this is why it's good to invite people over to the house every once in a while. <laughs> you get those things, oh, somebody's coming over, I'm gonna get that fixed. You know, I'll take care of it now. But people get used to apathy. People get used, and this is true spiritually in our life. You stay in a bad situation long enough, you start ignoring the situation or excusing the situation or blaming somebody else for the situation. He's just saying, hey, we, plural, we have a mess. Listen, folks, change never occurs in anybody's life till they just get dissatisfied and discontent. I didn't get saved till I realized how miserable I really was. I don't get right with God until I realize how empty my life has become. I don't get involved until I realize that my lack of involvement is the reason why I become such a spiritual sluggard. Now, obviously, you know, he deals with them in a very truthful manner. Now, I know that's not popular. Most pastors today want to talk about the walls and the gates and basically our spiritual lives and our foundations that are falling apart all around us. Pastors today just want to be positive and let's be happy and let's smile a lot. God bless you. God bless you all. God loves you. God wants to bless you today. In fact, I'm going to tell you right now, God bless you all. May God's fortunes and blessings be upon everybody. God bless you. God bless you in the morning. God bless you at lunch. God bless you at nighttime. God bless you while you're sleeping. God bless you when you go in the city. God bless you when you go in the country. God bless you. God bless you when you rise and God bless you when you fall asleep. God, and on and on it goes. You got the picture, right? Just, you know, we're dying of cancer and we're using Vaseline to fix it. Amen? Amen. So there is a point where you come back and say, we have got an issue. But listen, to, look at the motivators here. And if you look carefully at the verses, the way it breaks, he uses two motivational things and to, to get them to the place to realize they need to get on board. He says, hey, you know, we, we got to, he appeals to their testimony. We're, we're in disgrace. You know, we, we got a problem. You know, we're the people of God. This is God's city. This is Jerusalem. There's the temple. And this is, this is, the, this is the city of God. And look at us. There's no security. You know, the, the, everybody's, you know, demoralized and beat up. Whether you believe it or not, testimony is a strong, strong, persuasive motivator. We're the people of God. We ought to be where God wants us to be. We ought to be living how God wants us to live. We ought to be, you know, responding to the world around us the way God wants us to live. Because we're not like everybody else. We're not like everybody else. But yet, over and over, you see Christians trying to be like everybody else. But the stronger motivators, hey, God's got his agenda for your life, and you need to rise to that testimony on that occasion. The second thing he uses to appeal to them, you know, he uses the highest motivation for any Christian you can be appealed to, and that's for the glory of God. Because I believe within every child of God is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit 
is in your life and he's either being, he's in the process of filling, leading, teaching your life, or he's in the process of being grieved and chastening your life. But no matter what position you're in, I believe he creates in you a longing and a desire for the glory of God and to honor God and to be pleasing to God. That's his work in our life. That's the office ministry of the Holy Spirit to make us and to move us and to motivate us to be more like Jesus today than we were yesterday, more like him this year than we were yet last year. And so he, he appeals to that within their spirit. We're gonna do this for God. I mean, what is more appealing than say, hey, we're not gonna do something that's temporary. We're gonna do something that's eternal. We're not gonna do something that's gonna fade away in the next week or two. We're gonna do something that's gonna be eternal. In fact, it is so eternal, it is written in the word of God, what these people did for the glory of God. He says to him, you know, the whole world's laughing. I mean, that's just kind of the idea he's given. The kind of, these poor Jews, they say they worship the true God, but they can't even rebuild their own city. That's quite kind of hidden all this. They say their God's the greatest God of the whole world, but they can't even build walls. They're living in rubble. It's a bad testimony. Now he doesn't use external motivators here. These are internal motivators. You want to do something for God. You want to do something that's eternal. You want to do something that's bigger than you. You want to do something that's grand and glorious for the kingdom of God. That's what he's appealing to. And that's what appeals to Christians though. That's what appeals to, it works a lot better than external motivators. Now we do a lot of things in different ministry areas around here. And, and many times we turn, put little external motivators on. Whoever brings the most gets. You know, but the older I get, the less appealing that is. Right? I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Maybe something competitive or something, but ultimately that's what really satisfies me. You did something that made a difference in somebody's life for the glory of God. It was powerful. You touched a life. You made a difference. You made an impact. God did something. That's that, that's that eternal motivator. He didn't get up before the crowd. Hey, listen, whoever builds the, their section of the wall the fastest gets a three-day vacation down at the Dead Sea. That wouldn't be very appealing anyway. What's the greatest motivation in life? Well, here's a principle we should learn. The greatest motivation in life is not external, it's internal. But more than that, it's eternal. Let's do this for the glory of God. So God's name is not in disgrace. Let's rebuild the wall for the kingdom, for the glory of God and for the, and for the betterment of his people. These are the right kind of motives that challenge you. These are the right kind of things, motives that challenge your people. Now, the, 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 where he moves them to here is, is a, you know, he's, he's saying, hey, you know, I'm not just going to pump you up. There's something to be done here. And he asks for a response in ver verse 17. He said, this is a mess. Let's rebuild the wall. He calls for an action. He appeals to them to let us. That this is a plural thing. Let's, let's do something. Let, and let's do something specific. Let's don't hold a pep rally. Let's don't write songs on how we can rebuild the wall. Let's don't give some more sermons on how we can win souls. Let's go win souls. Let's do something for the glory of God. I mean, notice, and in, in, in this is important in, in leadership, is this, that he's realistic and he's optimistic. Yeah, we're in a mess. It's going to take some work. That's realistic. And he's optimistic. This is going to happen. I mean, he's realistic because the third thing he did is getting the facts on his midnight ride. He saw how bad the place was. And he tells him, these walls are in bad shape. I've looked at myself, but hey, it's okay. We're going to rise and rebuild. We're going to take care of the problem. So he sees the real and he sees the ideal. He sees what it is. It's in ruins, but he also sees what it can be. And that's true in your home. That's true in your church. That's true in whatever ministry you're doing. What it is right now, but what it can be, what the Lord wants it to be. And this is where Nehemiah's prayer is paid off. Anybody who just sees what can be, but not willing to face what is, well, that person... It's not a leader, it's just a visionary. Or any person who can tell you what it is, but he doesn't see what it can be, what the ideal is. That's, that, well, that's an accountant. You know, they just kind of gather the facts. They get the information down. But you look at both. What's actual, what's possible. And they're brought into harmony by somebody who's prayed up and ready to lead God's people. You see things. You ask for specific responses. I've told my staff before, when you ask everybody to do it, you know, maybe you'll have a specific task and you just kind of say, we need to get this done. And everybody says, amen, it's not going to get done. You need to be more specific. Here's what needs to be done and who's going to do that job? Who's going to take care of that need? Who's going to respond to that? Who's going to be specific in those? 
In fact, a lot of times I've discovered it's easy to just you know, have a little bit of insecurity about asking people and just say, you know, it's just easier if I do it myself. No, it's not. It's not easy if you do it by yourself. You probably won't even get it done. You don't have the time. You don't have all the energy. You don't have all the effort it's going to take to do something that's big for the glory of God. So never be afraid to ask people for specific responses. In your lift group, don't be afraid to ask people for a specific response. All right? In your Bible study, in your area of ministry, whether it's youth, children, whatever, never be afraid to ask people for a specific response. Here's where we're going. Here's what we need. Here's what God wants us to do. Who's going to do that? Now, the good part about this, he doesn't just stop there. Here's what we're going. He then gives a, a, a word of encouragement as, he, as he's addressing them. There's this word of personal testimony. In, in verse 18, he says, hey, Here's what this is all about. And he, and he tells them, first he said, I told them about how God had called me, how, what God had put on my heart to do in this project, all right? I told them how the gracious hand of God was upon me. I, I can imagine that he went into more detail than what we have just in the journal here. We actually told him everything that happened. How that Hanani in the first chapter remember, had told him how bad things were in Jerusalem after he came back from his trip. I'm sure he told him how he was burdened about that and he was broken about that and he began to pray and how ultimately God put it in his heart and he shares that with him, what God told me to do about it. And he just shared what God has laid on his heart and, what he, and he tells him what he's seen and what God wants to do. And then he tells about how the circumstances that he's gone through, the burden he had was confirmed. God, you know, it, 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 that God, God did this in behalf. God showed that we we're supposed to do this because God gave me permission from the king. And not only did the king allow me to have the letters I needed and to have the visas and passport information I needed and to have the materials I needed and the wagons to load me. He did, hey, he even gave me all the money to take care of the project. And on top of that, let me tell you what God did. God put it in his heart to pay for the deal and then send the Calvary with me. I believe there's an excitement here. Look what God can do. Look how God moves. Look how God works. This is how God works. This is what God wants. And it stirs up an excitement in the people's heart that God really is on this thing. God really is moving here. You know, one of the first things we do for those who've been through the 101 class at our church, I just share the background story on Believer's Fellowship. Man, let me tell you what God, let me tell you how this thing started. Let me tell you what God did. Let me tell you how God moved. Let me tell you how God took me, first of all, Depp Martin, and then he brought in a small group of people who just, you know, who, who caught the vision and how we moved in. And then all the opposition that we, we dealt with and the problems that we came up at the same time of moving forward, just sharing that with him about, about a 10 minute testimony of telling him what, how we got from point A to where we are today. And, you know, I get excited telling the story, but I see people who are in those classes also getting excited to see what, what, how we got where we are, what God's done. You know, that there's an excitement that builds out of this. Nehemiah just shared the testimony, how God called him and what the circumstances of his calling were. And now it's what we're going to do. Now we need to rebuild. What's happened? The vision's been transferred. There's, a, there's an enthusiasm, there's an excitement about what God's doing. He's, he's gone out, he's arrived, he's waited the right time, the right place. He's surveyed the situation. He's prayed, he's planned. And now he addresses the people. He shares the vision. What Nehemiah did to use his testimony is a, is a motivation, is a powerful thing. Why does he do that? Why does he say, here's what happened, here's what God did in me? Because he knows that people, they don't follow programs. People follow people, amen? Now he gets down to this situation of saying, you know, where he deals with, at the end of this passage, the problem of the opposers, all right? The people are on his side, why? The people are ready to follow because they've seen God on his testimony. They've seen God in his life, all right? They've seen, and by the way, if people don't see God on your life, they're probably not gonna follow you. Amen? Many times, and, and, and I've, I've dealt with a, a, a husband who comes in and says, nobody in my family wants to follow the leadership of my life. I said, can they see God on your life? There's a tendency for people that are believers not to go in directions that God wants them to to not go in, no matter who's leading. Amen? So the testimony has to be in your life that you, 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 God's on your life. And people want to people get on board when they see God moving. People are excited about it when they see God moving. I told the folks in Magnolia, they said, if you don't see God on your pastor's life, then don't follow your pastor. In fact, that go join another church. I would. I had a guy come off and tell me how ungodly I was. This was years ago. He came in and gave with a list. You're this, you're this, you're this, you're this. I said, do you really believe that? He said, I do. I said, you know, if I believe that, I wouldn't go to church here. So you just trying to get rid of me? I said, no, I don't know why you came to start with. 
I'm not trying. I'm your pastor. You join here. I'm, I'm going to shepherd you. You know, I'll try to be a faithful pastor to you, but if, I don't understand why you even come here if you believe all that. You know? The opposition comes. How do you deal with it? You answer them quickly and confidently. In verse 19, he says, but when, you know, when Sambalite, Horonite, Tobi, the Ammonite official, Geshem, and the Arab heard about it, they, they mocked us and ridiculed us. Catch that. In fact, it's interesting. The first time he just mentions those two, and now it mentions Gershom, the Arab. But where did he come from? Yeah. You know? But I'll tell you where he comes from. Anytime a negative person begins to voice their negativity, other negative people have a tendency to campaign with them. You know? They're not interested in the solution. I want my voice to be heard. I want to tell you about the problems we've got. You know, and they miss the whole mark about all this motivation of being righteous and godly and praying things through and seeking to honor the Lord in this regard. You know, they, you know, they just, they just move and they moved out of selfish reasons because they knew that if these city walls get rebuilt, it's going to affect the, the bottom line and how much money they're taking in. If, if you follow the story through in Nehemiah, which we will, you're going to see that he dealt with six different sources of opposition. I mean, he got it from every side. I just want to do the will of God. Why is everybody against me? The first opposition of strategy is what? They mocked and ridiculed. The second strategy was, you know, is that they, they accused them of rebelling against the king. All right? In Ezra 4, if you go back and look at the first time when, when, when Ezra's trying to rebuild the walls, that's the exact opposition and accusation that got the wall stopped last time. The Jews are rebuilding the wall. They get it rebuilt. We won't make anything for these people. You know, they're not going to pay attention to us anymore. And that's when the king issued a decree, no, no wall building. But now the king has issued a different decree and it's not going to work. So he said, I answered them. Catch this. He answered them saying, and I'm sure they were right in the crowd while he's trying to speak up. Boy, you can't do this. It's not, the king's not going to like this. The God of heaven will give us success. What an answer, amen. We are his servants and we're going to start rebuilding. It's for you. You don't have any share in Jerusalem. Any claim or historic right to it. I don't know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of a football fan. And I remember, I was it last year, year before, Marion Foster ran a touchdown in the early part of the season and some guy off the bench tackled him and throwing a celebration. And uh, Aaron Foster, he was mic'd up, you know, the NFL mic on, and he said, I don't know you. <laughs> he was all brag, said, like, it's kind of like, who do you, think? okay, you got a tackle, but who are you? <laughs> the, 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 the situation, we're the people of God. Who are you? You don't have any part in this. You have no place in this. You have no portion in the heritage of Jerusalem. Yeah. You're outsiders. We're the insiders. And he just deals with it. I mean, they're, first, they're stunned by the opposition, but it's only temporarily. And they, you know, they start several times the rest of the book. You know, they, every time they, they can, they're trying to you know, take away the morale and the excitement and the, and the passion. You know. John said it this way in 1 John 3. He said, don't be surprised, my brothers, when the world hates you. In other words, if you start working for God and you start moving forward for God and you start doing what God wants you to do, expect the opposition. Don't be surprised by it. As a lot of people get surprised by it. You know, they, they get all saved and they run off to school or to work and they start telling their friends, I got saved and people start laughing at them, ridicule them. And they're, they're all upset. It's, he just says, you know, it's going to happen. The moment you hang your sign out here for Jesus, guess what? Somebody's going to start throwing rocks at it. The, the only way to not be criticized in this life, friends, is to do nothing, be nothing, say nothing. Amen? Amen? Someone who questions every time we choose to grow, every time we choose to move, every time we choose to add on, every time we choose to progress or to do something or to have some format or some program that brings glory to God, wants to reach people and press us out of our little comfort zones, you know, you know they just get all frustrated and all mad about stuff. You know, people need the Lord. And we're going to continue to lead the church toward reaching people. But people have to follow that. Every lift leader in here ought to have a plan and a goal for that ministry. It ought, it ought to be your passion to grow that ministry, to multiply that ministry, that out of your group comes many groups. It ought to be a passion. You ought to have a plan you're working towards. Though. People you're reaching out to. A plan on how we can get our people in my group to reach the people that are their neighbors and their friends and their relatives to build that group. Every youth leader, every student leader, every children's worker ought to have a plan and a passion that they're pursuing and following with a vision and a goal to see people's lives changed, to see the walls rebuilt, to see hope given to people. 
Not to sit around and just be satisfied with status quo. Well, things are good in my group. No, what are we going to do for God? What are we, what are we planning? What's big for God? What, what's moving forward? What are we doing to make a difference in the kingdom? That should be every person in this room. If you're just the person who comes to church and sits on your blessed assurance and enjoys, you know, the music or the preaching, but you walk away, but there's, there's no place where you're plugging your life in and saying, you know, I, I, I've got a goal for the kingdom. I, I, got, I got to work for the kingdom. I've, I, I want to do something for the glory of God here. If that, you know, you're missing out. You're missing out on some of the greatest joys you will ever experience. But more than that, you're missing out on the opportunity to make investments in eternity for the glory of God that are higher and greater and more noble than anything this world can ever offer you. You may achieve and accomplish great things in the realm of this world and get to heaven and be empty handed at the presence of God, in the presence of God, still saved as a child of God, but never done anything for the glory of God that's eternal and lasting. That's not the way God intended you. And if that's what God had in mind, you know, I'd have shot you the day you got saved. Get you on home, get you out of trouble before you make a mess. Amen? Can you see? I lead you to Jesus, brother Tim shoots you. <laughs> Send another one home, Lord. Boom. <laughs> now nah, he's been tempted, but I won't let him. <laughs> Amen. We're all here for the glory of God. So get up off your blessed assurance and live in that blessed assurance. And let's do something for the glory of God. It involves having a strategy for your life of being an evangelist. We're all evangelists. The Bible says do the work of evangelists. We're all, we're all disciples. Who am I discipling? Who am I helping? Who am I leading? Who am I growing? You know, who am I reaching out to? Who am I ministering to? What ministry do I have in the body of Christ? You say, well, I don't have one. Well, get one. Yeah. Amen. Well, what one? I think you spend time with God. He'll tell you what one. And I would not doubt that if God's already told you what one. Because that's the way he works. But what will you do for the glory of God? You want to be a leader? Then you have to get up and you have to move forward. Look at these things we said. Expect opposition. Then use the timing God gives you. You know, make sure you understand the facts. And identify with those people that you're working with. We're together in this. If you've got opposition in your little rank area of ministry, it's hard to go and it's hard to grow. If you're the negative voice in your ministry, you know, find out, ask yourself, why am I such a negative voice in this? You know? I say, well, you know, somebody needs to be against it. Or five, I don't be afraid to tell people the truth about what's going on and where they're at. Number six, get specific with people. What can you do for the glory of God? What can I do? Encourage one another. Encourage others. Here's what God's doing in my life. Here's what the Lord spoke to me. To me as a pastor, there's nothing more exciting when somebody comes in the office and says, hey, I believe the Lord's wanting me to start this area of ministry or do this. And then just start to equip them and watch them fulfill what God's given them a dream and a passion to do and carry it out and do it. That's exciting. Answer quickly and confidently when the opposition comes. Hey, I'm a mission for God. I'm on a mission for God. I'm living for Jesus. I'm giving my life to him. You know, this is, this is true. These, these simple things, like I say, some of this, uh, like I say, I've used mostly in, 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 in pastoral training and things like that, but every one of us, we have challenges you know, whether we're in some big leadership position or not, we're all called to be influencers for the kingdom. Don't think that everybody's going to jump on board with that because they're not. But you have a testimony and you can make a difference. And the very people that ridicule in the beginning may be the very people you reach for Christ. When my brother used to come over and witness to me, you know, after he realized I can keep knocking on the door, he just wouldn't leave. You know, he'd sit down. I'd, I'd ridicule him, laugh at him, you know. I didn't. You never know what God's doing in somebody's heart and life, do you? That very person that's ridiculing you, laughing at you the most, be the very person that gets saved, gets right with God. So just be prepared for it. Just realize it comes with the turf. It's part of the territory. You just decide you're going to live for Jesus no matter what anybody else thinks. You know, hey, that's the beginning of leadership right there. I'm going to live for God no matter what anybody thinks. And I'm going to pursue him with a passion. Amen. With a choice that you may be sitting today and not even know Jesus. Understand, when you come to Jesus, you might as well get it over with. Amen. His life starts there. Come to Christ, but there'll be people who oppose it. 
Some here today, and you know that it's like a man shared with me this morning. He said, Pastor, I, I'm not leading in, in my family anywhere. I, there's things in my life that are not right. I, I, I've been out of church. I've been away from God. There was a time in my life I had a passion, and I've lost that passion. Got honest. Didn't try to minimize his own situation. Got real about his situation. Said, I'm just going to start living for God. You know, I tell people, just press on. Don't wait for the feelings. You just go. Feelings will catch up. Sooner or later, they'll, they'll catch you by surprise, maybe. Maybe you're the parent, a husband, a wife. Do what God's telling you to do. Move forward. Believe God. Trust God. As a young person in this room, hey, sure people are going to laugh. But I want you to know there'll come a day when they'll come looking for you. There's a Proverbs I share out of chapter 16 that talks about that. That the words out of your mouth and the life that you live will be, the word uses is pleasant, but the idea is it becomes desirable. Sooner or later, people start desiring what you have to say because you stuck with it and because you were consistent and because you were committed. It's an attractive thing. Light attracts. Sometimes bugs, but it attracts. <laughs> well, half of us are here, right? <laughs> but that's the grace of God and that's the glory of God. Let's make an influence. No, Lord, the Lord doesn't told us the exact day, but I cannot believe that we have a lot, a lot of time left to do what we're going to do. Quit putting off what God's called you to do. Get after it. Hallelujah. There's some in this room right now who ought to be involved in our youth ministries. There's some of you ought to be involved in children's ministries. There's some of you ought to be involved in outreach ministries. There's some of you ought to be involved in, in the other different areas of ministry where the clothing, the food pantries, all these different areas of ministries. Some of you ought to be involved. And you're not. What are you waiting on? And some of you are involved, may have lost your vision. Get after it. Get on board. Let's do something bigger than ourselves for Jesus. This is the day to do it in. Because this is the day we have the most criticism. Let's rise to the occasion. Let's stand with our heads bowed.